are at the appointed time. <laughs> I want to welcome everybody to the Board of Directors meeting. And this uh, meeting is to set the agenda for the April 17th Board of Directors meeting, which will occur at 6 o'clock. And the first thing tonight is we have some wonderful presentations. And I will ask Director Wyrick to slide over uh, here because I get to go make the first two. Oh boy, I'm in charge tonight. Vice Mayor Webb for a presentation. Thank you. And the first thing we have is a proclamation. Um, and whereas a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which is CDH, comes about when the diaphragm of a fetus does not fully develop, therefore allowing abdominal organs to push into the chest cavity, preventing normal lung development, and whereas one in every 2,500 pregnancies are diagnosed with a CDH, it's often a life-threatening birth defect because it limits the growth and development of the lungs. Whereas since 2000, it is estimated that over 500,000 babies have been born with CDH. However, only 50% of those babies survived. And whereas CDH is as common as spina bifida and cystic fibrosis, however, very few people know about it or are aware of it. Each year, 1,600 babies are born with CDH in the United States. And whereas there are many people living in Arkansas who have been diagnosed with and have survived their CDH, although many families in Arkansas have endured the horrible pain and grief associated with the loss of loved ones with CDH, whereas those with CDH often endure multiple surgeries and possible medical complications beyond their diagnosis, that include heart defects, pulmonary complications, gastric and intestinal problems, developmental delays, and may require respiratory and medicinal support for years. Whereas raising awareness of this congenital defect will help bring about acceptance and support for those suffering with it and will advocate for urgently needed medical research and advances. Now, therefore, I, Kathy Webb, Vice Mayor of the City of Little Rock, do hereby proclaim April 19th, 2018, as congenital diaphragmatic to a family member whose niece died as a result of this terrible disease. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to segue to a, a happier note. And it is a great pleasure to recognize a wonderful Ward 3 school. And you may have seen this, uh, but in case you didn't, last Saturday marked the 125th anniversary of the first basketball game ever played in Little Rock. On April 7, 1893, just a few blocks from here at 4th and Main, a team from Little Rock hosted a team from Pine Bluff. Pine Bluff had been practicing for six months. The Little Rock team was formed the night before the game. The lack of practice was evident as Pine Bluff beat Little Rock. The game may not have gone our way, but basketball was here to stay in the Rock. And today we're here to celebrate a group of young men who know the value of teamwork and practice. They're carrying on that legacy from 125 years ago. Because of their hard work over many weeks, today we honor them for their school's very first basketball championship. On March the 10th, the Jefferson Patriots won the Central Arkansas Elementary School League Championship. They won 11 games and only had one loss. The team has eight fifth graders, five fourth graders, two third graders, and one second grader. In the tournament, Jefferson had a first round bye. Then they defeated the Crystal Hill Magnet School. 
and number one seeded Chenal Elementary on the way to the finals. Jefferson was the number four seed. And in the finals, they defeated Mabelvale Elementary by a score of 30 to 29. With only four and a half minutes to go, Jefferson was down by nine points when they went on a 12 to two run. A free th throw by someone we know named Luke Moore put the team ahead. Caleb Blair stole the ball from the other team just before time ran out to assure that the Patriots would win the game. The team captains are Luke Moore and Manu Grabelli. They're coached by Brian Johnson and Jody Massey. And the principal who is also here with us today is Sandra Register. And we have a team, uh, we have a plaque if the team would come up and I believe we have a handheld microphone so the team members can introduce themselves because they would be hidden by the right. podium. So can we get the team to come up and we'll... Come on around. Come on around, we'll do a picture and then we'll have you all introduce yourselves. Have you guys ever had your picture taken this way? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and there's here's the mic. And if everybody, if you all would introduce yourselves and the coach. Coach, let you go first. How's everybody doing? Turn this way. Okay. Hello. How are y'all doing? <laughs> um, just wanted to say we had a lot of fun this year. Um, our programs come a long way. Uh, we started probably 10 years ago, and this is our first championship. Uh, we consider ourselves to be like a family, um, along with the rest of Jefferson Elementary. They support us a lot. Um, again, we've just had a lot of fun. I'm always going to remember this group. Um, every year we stack it up after practice, and one of our things would say one, two, three, hard work. Well, that hard work finally paid off. So, Congratulations. Our second grader, does he need to come around here? Because you can't see him either. <laughs> My name's Brooks, and I'm in second grade. Second grade. My name's Will, and I'm in third grade. My name's Chase, and I'm in third grade. My name's Christiana, and I'm in fourth grade. My name is Clay, and I'm in fourth grade. My name is Caleb, and I'm in fourth grade. My name is Fisher, and I'm in fourth grade. My name is Luke Walker, and I'm in fourth grade. My name is Adam, and I am fifth grade. My name is Kaden, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Carson, and I'm in fifth grade.
My name is Manu, and I'm in fifth grade. Y'all already know me, but my name's Luke Moore, and I'm in the fifth grade. We've got three individuals who are not here. Um, they're all fifth graders, Jay Sean, uh, Corbin, and Chase Forte. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. She wanted, didn't want to speak. I am Jody Massey. I am a coach. Thank you for, thank you for, thank you for talking her into it. And we recognize the principal, and also want to rec recognize Superintendent Mike Poor for being here. The Central Arkansas Elementary School League is organized by Mr. Darian Smith the principal of Mabelvale Elementary. He puts in a great deal of additional effort to make sure the league runs smoothly. It's a positive experience for the players, the coaches, and the parents. This is the eighth year for the league, which includes 25 teams from Little Rock School District and the county, Pulaski County Special School District. As a former youth basketball coach, I understand all the hard work that goes into running a team. Making a league work smoothly requires even more work, and he does all of this on top of his work as an elementary school principal. So we would like to present a plaque to Mr. Darian Smith in appreciation for his efforts. Good, evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, she said I could say a few words. I was doing just fine until she reminded me that we lost to Jefferson in the championship game. <laughs> but we, uh, Coach Johnson said it a few years ago, Jefferson was the team you wanted to play on in the league. Uh, if they scored four or five points a game, it was good. Uh, this year, was, Jefferson was one of the teams you didn't want to play. Uh, but the most important thing about Jefferson's team is they played as a team. Uh, and it was one of the things that we tried to stress with our students in the league, how important it is to, to enjoy winning, as well as be a team in losing. Uh, and Jefferson demonstrated that each week, celebrating each other and their success on and off the court. So we want to thank them. Uh, and recognition and Mr. Moore, we appreciate it as well. And thank you all. Thank you. And before you all leave, could we have all the parents who are here uh, stand up and let us acknowledge you as well. Thank you. Yes, that is Ms. Register. If she would like to say something. First of all, I want to let you know how excited I am to be here. Started the year. This is my first year at Jefferson, but I taught there for 17 years. So I'm going back home for my, as Mr. Poor, I told Mr. Poor for my retirement. I'm going to stay there until I retire unless he moves me. Um, but I told Coach when I first met him, I said, I don't like to lose. And uh, last year I was at Terry and we won last year at Terry. So it's, uh, maybe that's a little bit of luck. But I will have to say this is a special team. Uh, they do play well together. I never gave up on them. I think I don't know that the parents gave up on them that game. We were behind. It was very nerve-wracking. I was ready to go tell Mr. Smith congratulations. And I was really I was. And um, then we came back. I mean, they fought and they fought and they fought, and came back. And then Luke's free throw, and then Caleb's. Still at the end, I love to watch that video, and uh, they they deserve it because they, this is a hard working team. They probably practice what three four times a week, and it makes that makes the difference. Hard work pays off, and it really does. And I'm proud of them, and I hope they have a great career when they leave Jefferson and move on to Little Rock Middle Schools and High Schools. And thank you so much for having us. 
Thank you all for being here. We have uh, one more championship team that we are going to present a plaque to, Director Hines. Thank you, Vice Mayor, fellow board members, and Bruce and Tom. On March 10th, 2018, at the Bank of the Ozarks Arena, the Baptist Preparatory Academy Eagles won their third consecutive 4A Boys State Championship. Since state high school championships in basketball started in 1909, only three other schools have won at least three consecutive state basketball championships. Pine Bluff, Little Rock Central, Ken, and Little Rock Hall twice, Vice Mayor. So the Baptist Prep Eagles also won state championships in 1997, 1999, and 2009, making this year their sixth state boys basketball championship. Baptist Prep defeated Jonesboro Westside by a score of 76 to 52. Along the way in the tournament, they defeated Ashdown and Riverview to get to the championship game. It capped off a season with 30 wins and only six losses. Isaac McBride was named All-State his second year to receive this honor. For the second year in a row, Mr. McBride was also named the 4A Boys MVP of the state tournament. He, along with Jerry and Collins and James Singleton, were named to the 4A All-Tournament team. The Eagles are coached by Brian Ross, Caleb Surley, Mark Thompson, and Marcus White are the assistant coaches. Dr. Laura Bedner is the headmaster, and Steve Miller is the athletic director. Coach, if you and your team would come up, I'd like to present you with this plaque. So on this on this plaque, Mayor Mark Stuttle, the City Board of Directors, and City Manager Bruce T. Moore congratulate the Baptist Preparatory Academy Eagles 2018 Boys Basketball 4A State Champions. In the quest for the championship, the players and coaches exemplified outstanding sportsmanship, participation, leadership, responsibility, and teamwork. There you go. Thank you. Please say a few words, and then, gentlemen, if you'll introduce yourselves, give us your year, and if you're college bound and you know where you're going, especially if some of you'd like to go ahead and declare. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Coach. Uh, thank you all for having us today. Uh, very proud and very honored to be here for a third year in a row. Um, you know, if you told us that three years ago, we, you know, we might not have believed it or not, but credit goes to these guys. Um, a lot of hard work went into this, a lot of discipline. Um, we always talk about how hard it is to repeat as champions because everybody's kind of gunning for you and and uh, it, it takes a lot of discipline to come back hungry the next season after you've won it the year before. Um, we lost a lot of talent from last year's team, but we had younger guys step up and, and take over their roles and excel uh, pretty much right from the start of the season and then they continue to improve all year. Um, I would say that this team was really characterized by their unselfish nature uh, they truly played as a team. Uh, they truly outworked uh, everybody, I believe. And then uh, they, they came up big in the biggest moments. You know, every team faces some adversity. And in our final four game, we were down one with three point something seconds left. And uh, Mr. McBride here hits a, what, about a 30 foot shot uh, at the buzzer so that we got to go to the state finals. And, uh, and then in the state finals, uh, everybody pretty much showed up and played a pretty good game, and uh, we didn't have to have any 30-footers at the buzzer in that one. Uh, I would like to commend our seven seniors uh, who finished their career uh, having no idea what it feels like to lose the last game of the season. Uh, that's something that's pretty special to win three state championships in a row for those guys, and I'm very proud of all of them. Uh, our entire team, too, I would just say is I'm as proud of them off the court as I am on. Uh, these guys carry a 3.44 GPA uh, through the first semester of this year and uh, are continuing that this semester, it looks like. And um, just their character off the floor is, is exemplary as well. So I'm very proud of them. James Singleton, I'm a senior and I'm headed to the University of Arkansas next year. Uh, Joshua Booker, I'm a senior. I'm headed to University of Alabama next year. I'm James Renshaw. I'm a senior, and I'm headed to Washtenaw Baptist University next year. 
I'm J. Van Collins, and I'm a senior. Jackson Hudkins, and I'm a senior, and I'm going to the Air Force Academy. Isaac McBride, undecided. <laughs> Manley Roberts, I'm a junior. Andrew Evans, I'm a sophomore. Brooks Spoon, and I'm a sophomore. <laughs> Hayden Bagley, I'm a junior. Ryan Jones, I'm a junior. Daniel Cobb, and I'm a freshman. DJ Townsend, and I'm a freshman. Congratulations to you all. Do we have any parents in the in the room from the Baptist? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll give folks a moment or so to uh, leave. We invite others to stay if you would like. Uh, Director Wright. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to have to leave here in about 10 minutes. We have Bolo Bash uh, kickoff at uh, Ripsonman Tennis Center uh, with our United States tennis team. Uh, qualifying rounds are here, so it, it's a very big event for us, and I will be leaving to give the welcome. And I believe the mayor's out of town, so he won't. So I, we definitely need to have a presence there, so I'll be doing that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Director Hendricks. Yes, I want to share with the board that I received many, many calls from my ward concerning the um, proposal. Well, it really was a movement on that property at 4701 West 31st, and I have asked Victor to let me know if the person that did the presentation about the property owns that property. So you all will be hearing from me later, but my ward constituents were really disturbed about it. Okay. Did somebody step over in a ward and then vote for it? So you all may have repercussions. Time will tell. 4701 West 31st. I've slept since then. Hmm? Okay. I've slept since then. I don't remember what that is. Okay. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you. And if you would take a moment to look at the modifications page, we have three additions. And if there are no questions on those, we will go to the items on the consent agenda for questions. Director Adcock, will you repeat that? I didn't have the mic on yet. I would like to have a presentation on M2. Director Adcock, um, M2 dates back to the initial ordinance to uh, levy the 38 cent capital improvement sales and compensating use tax. Uh, when that ordinance was passed, the board also passed a resolution indicating that they would like to use three, up to $3 million of the tax revenues uh, in agreement with the Arkansas State Fair Association. Excuse me, that's not the one I asked for. It said M2. M2. M2 is the agreement with the Arkansas State Fair Association. M2 is on the top of the second page. Well, we got M2 right there. There's an M2 ordinance and an M2 resolution. I think. Okay. Sorry. M3. I thought you wanted to hear from me. Oh, well. No, I, when, <laughs> I remember doing that. <laughs> Mr. Collins. No, this is the uh, special event center in the extraterritorial location. Good afternoon, 
Vice Mayor, members of the board. Scott, if you'll pull up the site plan. Um, pull up the zoning plan, please. That'll give a little bit of outside. It is, uh, Director Adcock, this, this site is an extraterritorial. It's just south. It's just, Rest of Tractor Lane is off of David O. Dodd, just south of Lawson Road on the west side of 430. Um, and it's outside the city right now. You can kind of see the city limits as adjacent to the property on the east and on the west and on the south side of this property. This is a little bitty tract of property that's on that to the north side. Rest of Tractor Lane just comes off of David O. Dodd. Uh, what they have there is this used to be a working uh, dairy farm, you know, on there, uh, the Kinzel Dairy, and they have uh, added a, a winery to this uh, tract of land also. They got all their approvals to do so at the county level and the state level. And what they're looking to come in uh, for us is to uh, change the zoning for that tract of land that you see up there from R2, you know, uh, to plan development commercial to allow for an event center, you know, to hold weddings, um, you know, events there kind of ties into that uh, vineyard type, you know, uh, event center. Uh, they've also uh, put in times that they're going to be operational uh, from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Friday and Saturday are supposed to be 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. and Sunday from 11 a.m. to midnight. Uh, the dumpster hours, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Now, they, uh, there is, a, go to the site plan, Scott. I don't know if you can see uh, some of that. Might have to zoom in a little bit. There are some buildings that are going to rejuvenate that's existing, that's out there. The existing dairy barn, uh, they're more of the darker colors. The lighter magenta building is uh, the addition to it. And then they're going to add parking over to the west side, uh, about 30, I believe 32 stalls uh, to add for the parking. And they're going to extend uh, access off of Rusty Tractor Lane down uh, to the end of that to allow for the parking. You said they was going to add 32 parking places. How many total parking places would that make for them? Well, right now there's none, so that's, it'll be the 32. They have a, an area, kind of a gravel area, so this is more of an extension of that. There's not really a designated parking area, so it's 32 is what they're going to have. So was I correct? They have city limits on two sides of their property? Yes, ma'am. Uh, three sides, actually. They have it on the east side, the west side, and the south side of the property. Mr. Moore, what does that do for our security of that location? If our police had to go, if they had something that we needed a lots of police or a lots of fire too, with having two or three sides on the city, but the majority of the flat property in the county, what would that do to our security and our safe, public safety? Uh, Dr. Derek, I'm just getting back in there. We're talking about M3 that's in the extraterritorial. Yeah. It's on the extraterritorial, but it's that's two that's sides right. of it is inside the city limits. What'd you say? See, the director act asked about the adjacent. Scott, if you bring up the zoning map again, you kind of see the uh, the city limits uh, is adjacent on three of the sides, the east side, the west side, and the south side. Well, um, obviously, uh, we'll continue to patrol uh, in the, within the city limits, but not in the extraterritorial jurisdiction. But the streets are in the... Uh, in the city limits. David O'Dodd is in the city limits. David O'Dodd is in the city limits. And you have uh, lots of subdivisions out there. Director Adcock, in terms of jurisdiction, a law enforcement officer's jurisdiction, if it is a local police officer, usually stops at the city lines. However, if it's an offense that the officer observes outside the city limits and is serious, the officer can still take action. That's one thing that will happen. The second thing that I suspect will happen is, is that there will be a cooperative agreement between the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office and the Little Rock Police Department to be able to use the state statute that allows for emergency services from one or both jurisdictions in a time of need 
and that will take care of the immediate situation. If there were to be a search of the property that's within the county aspect of it, then the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office would probably be seeking that search warrant, although uh, it may be a joint task force situation in which we would be involved. But in terms of an immediate issue, I don't have a problem with it uh, because it's going to be what the officer sees committed in front of them. That said, you know, if it's uh, spitting on the sidewalk and that's a county ordinance, which I don't think there is one, but giving you that, the Little Rock police aren't going to be able to make an arrest within the county for that. But if it's any type of assault, if it's any type of battery, if it's a felony drug offense, things of that nature, then just going slightly over the city limits to do that at the same location, it's not going to be defeating. And the only reason I know this is because I had a murder case that actually turned on that very issue once, and so I've been reading this law since 1976. Well, on the uh, sewer, are they getting sea sewer, or are they, where are they getting their sewer from? I don't know. The city has put a limit at the city limits with the exception of Shannon Hills, the exception of the Wrightsville facility uh, on sewer, uh, and so I don't know if that's by uh, a okay. septic tank or something else. I would like more answers on the sewer, Mr. Okay. Collins, please. Yes, ma'am. And the water, of course, I'm sure they have city water out there. Is that a subdivision over to the right? I can't tell if those are houses or... Yes. And we the, we didn't receive any complaints um, on who, this. Who was notified in that area? Um, well, everybody within the 200-foot or radius of that, and then Southwest United for Progress was notified. Okay. I'd like this one to be kept separate, Vice Mayor. Sorry? I'd like this to be kept separate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Mm -hmm. Director, for uh, is it for him? Because Director Wright also has a question, and you're getting ready to... Not on this one. Okay. Mr. Collins, I think Director Wyrick also has a question on this same topic. M3. Um... When I looked at my agenda at home today, I did not see this M2 ordinance on on the agenda. When did that get added? That was a request to be added after the agendas went out. It, Director Weirich, it's not, that's why it's on the modification page. Uh, there was a request that I received late, late last week, uh, Friday afternoon, I believe. Okay. This just went through the Planning Commission on Thursday, so what's what's the what's the rush? The uh, applicant is, uh, and, and, and this has happened in the past, and we don't, we're not always able to accommodate, but when it's uh, unanimous planning commission staff approval and, and the staff informed me that they could get the information out uh, by Monday, um, I, we try to accommodate if we can. Yeah. Um, so somehow in our Southwest United for Progress meetings, um, we did not get notified of, of this. Now, I, I think they got notified, but it, we did not get it covered in our um, monthly meetings with Southwest United for Progress. And the night before the Planning Commission, I just happened to be looking at their agenda because there were a couple of things I was interested in and saw this. And I called uh, Crystal Valley Neighborhood Association, which is very near to where this is, and um, I didn't know anybody in the subdivision to the east of this to call, but um, the neighborhood president there was not aware of, of this application. I spoke with her last night, and she called uh, nine or ten neighbors um, that are in close proximity to, the, proximity to this, and it's my understanding that they have objections to it. And I believe because... Um, the notification didn't go to Crystal Valley um, and lack of notification through Southwest Ups. I think you might have had some people at the Planning Commission to object to it. 
So, um, I'm, I'm with Joan. I think we need to keep this separate because I believe we will have some uh, folks that um, will want to talk about it. I'm also a little bit concerned that it came up on Thursday at the Planning Commission and now it's coming before us and there's not really that much time to notify people that this is coming up. Uh, can you tell if there were individuals uh, that were notified in the the neighborhood association to the east? No, the, the only notifications that were sent out is what I just said, the 200 feet radius. And Did the applicant, the, would the applicant have had to notify any of those people to the east in that subdivision? If they was in the 200 foot, I can get the list of all the notifications, the receipts that we got back. Okay. Well, they're directly across the street. Would it be notification from the property line or from where? It is from the property line. It is from the property line. So you would think that they would have hit some of those people right along David O'Dodd Road. And they, there was some calls uh, from that neighborhood there were. that I know of, but it okay. was not, none of them was in opposition. There, were, there was, was not no noted. opposition. Okay. All right. Well, I still think we need to keep it separate. So um, if there are objections, we can hear them. Thank you. Thank you. Director Wright. Yes, Mr. Moore, I'd like a presentation on M1. You're next. Let me call on the uh, Assistant Director of Little Rock Zoo to come forward. Hello. Hi. I do not have a full presentation. This resolution was passed and the bid went out and now the American Structure, uh, Structure Inc. Is, um, has got the bid and has, is being awarded the bid once this resolution is passed. What is it? It's a colobus, which what is, is a monkey. Oh. It's a black and, <coughs> excuse me, a black and white um, monkey, African monkey, and then the serval is a small cat. So it's an oh, exhibit. An these animal are animals. Exhibit. Yes, it's okay. an animal exhibit for. And I was looking oh, at that myself. It doesn't say anything about the Little Rock Zoo no. up there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we building a building for a million dollars. Where where we get that money from? No, no. This is uh, this is for the Little Rock Zoo. Okay, so these are. This is an animal exhibit. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I know. Okay. I I don't know why it didn't say the Little Rock Zoo up there. Okay. Okay, that that explains that. I, I didn't. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. All thank right, you. Welcome. Any other questions? Uh, okay. Director Hendricks. Mine was with Jeremy. Yeah, with Jeremy. It had to, yeah, it had to do with what uh, the two directors were speaking about. Mr. Collins. Is any of this Ward One? Did I understand anybody to say Ward One? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Director Adcock. Yes, Mr. Moore, I would like to request that we put this off for two weeks. I've never heard of one going before the Planning Commission on Thursday and then the next Tuesday we look at it. I'd like to give time for Director Wyrick to contact the neighborhood people out there and visit with them on this. Again, that's fine. Uh, we have, this This isn't uh, something we, we haven't done before. And again, it's usually, uh, uh, if there's no comments at the planning commission, but and, and it's again at the applicant's request that we move this forward and due to some of his development issues, but that's fine. We can, uh, Jamie's staff can let them know. Okay. Thank you. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Director Richardson. Yes, vice, yes, vice Mayor. Thank you. Lance, as usual, I'm flummoxed on this one because I'm not sure if we did land this to drum up opposition. Um, or to get these questions answered, I think the separated will give us enough time to have people who had objections to it to come down and speak against it or give us opportunity, Bruce, to answer some kind of questions. So I don't know if the delay is us to figure out a way to drum up some opposition or what. So Lance, I'm flummoxed as usual. So I'm not sure I understand the necessity for uh, putting it off for two weeks. Let me just say, uh Again, we have done it, it but it, it's not, we don't do it when it's a potential for um, some uh, opposition or controversy. So we'll, we'll just, we can wait and then come up and to be honest, 
um, two weeks wouldn't be the normal. Um, it, it's probably usually after planning commission. It's about yeah six weeks, but it's two weeks. So okay with everybody. Okay. So that'd be the first. Let's see. Let's do. Be May first. Okay. So May first. Okay, are there any questions about the items 1 through 10 on the consent agenda? <laughs> Director Richardson? Yes, Bruce, so your, your request or question, uh, the two-week issue doesn't necessarily require a vote. It's just a recommendation from one board member, and you administratively make that decision. Uh According to the rules, I can bring something forward on the agenda, which I I had three items that that, I, that were on there. Um, my again, it's out of the normal process. So um, again, the normal process would be four weeks from now. Right. So we're still, I think, expediting it somewhat. Thank you. Items one through ten on the consent agenda. Do we have any? Questions, any requests for a presentation? <laughs> Director Wyrick. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I would like to know what uh, we're purchasing on item two, a trauma FX whole body trauma simulator. What is that and what is it used for? Sure, let me call our Assistant uh, Emergency Management Director. It's uh, really out of curiosity. Nathan More Spicer. than being against it, I'm just, right. I, don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, Vice Mayor, uh, Board. Uh, the Trauma Effects uh, Whole Body Simulator is a trauma simulator used for the Little Rock Police Department, Fire Department, MIMS. Uh, the purchase falls in line with the current active shooter aggressor ex exercises conducted uh, by those departments. Uh, the Whole Body Simulator is a rugged and realistic full body trainer that is purpose built for field exercises in all weather conditions uh, offers realistic leg movement lifelike arterial bleeding um, personnel can use field techniques such as hand knee elbow pressure uh, it offers pulses breathing real-time feedback via all via remote control so you can have somebody treating the mannequin or the simulator in one one spot and there somebody else uh, controlling the mannequin as to what the, the reactions are and stuff. So it's assembly, it's, uh, essentially a, a trauma mannequin. So, okay. so it's a training, it's a training tool. It's it my is. understanding we have a grant to take care of this. We do. It's it's a hundred percent funded through the Department of Homeland Security. So okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Other questions on one through ten. Items 11 and 12. Seeing no questions on those items, I think we have a, a report. 11 and 12 can be grouped. I'm sorry? They can be grouped. They'll have to be read separately, but they can be grouped. Uh, yes, please. Vice Mayor and members of the board, uh, my name is Tom Kane. I'm with Stevens Insurance. And today I'm going to present a update of our health plan and some of the initiatives that we have undertaken. And so if we can go to the next slide. Uh, just to look back a little history, um, as you remember, we switched to United Healthcare January 1 of 2016. Uh, that was a difficult year for us in which we had 106.3% loss ratio. And what drove a lot of that was 19 claimants who had $100,000 or more in payments. You can see in 2017 things improved dramatically and uh, to an 82.6% claim to premium ratio. And I think a lot of the improvement was due to we had less large claimants, only 11 in 2017. And for the 12 months ending January of 2018, it's ticked up a little bit, but still running pretty good at 85.1%. So any questions before we move to the next slide? Okay. So we are currently out to bid for third-party administration services 
or self-funding for the health plan. And that RFP was released to United Healthcare, uh, UMR, Blue Cross Blue Shield, QualChoice, HealthScope, CoreSource, WebTPA, HealthCheck360, Maritain, and Cigna on March 19. Those responses are due Friday, and we will begin our analysis next week. Now, there are multiple network options that are available to the city. You have your traditional carrier networks, United Healthcare, Blue Cross, Cigna, Aetna, and you also have, if you remember, uh, the critically or clinically integrated network options, uh, both Baptist Health Physician Partners and Arkansas Health Network with CHI have developed these clinically integrated networks. They are uh, clearly, they're smaller networks than the traditional networks, but they uh, offer the opportunity for more management within the network. Um, both of them do include UAMS and Children's, and both of them have national network wraps for services not available locally. Another option that we have uh, worked with at Stevens with some of our larger clients is a Centers of Excellence program uh, through Edison Health. And Centers of Excellence is where Edison Health has identified uh, health care providers around the country that do specific procedures with a high degree of quality, and they negotiate fees for that. It can be structured as optional for the employees, or in some cases, some employers make it mandatory. So, for example, if you want to have a hip or knee replacement, you might have to go to Springfield, Missouri, or uh, Pensacola, Florida. And then the pharmacy benefit management vendors that we uh, work with, and you may, this was in the news recently at the state legislature, um, in the special session there was legislation passed dealing with the PBMs. The traditional, the Express Scripts, Optum, and Caremark, we work with all three of those at Stevens. Uh, but we are also have our own pharmacy practice. We have three pharmacists on staff, and we are currently in the process of negotiating a master contract. So we'll share that with the city as well. So a lot of options, a lot of analysis and work to do, uh, but we're pretty excited about the opportunity for the city. And then finally, we get to the next slide, uh, wellness strategy. So currently we're in year one of a wellness strategy in which we are requiring all employees to get an adult physical. Okay, that began last July 1st and ends June 30. And those employees who do not get an adult physical during that time period will pay $50 a month. Uh, to date, 850 employees have completed the requirement. Now, typically when we initiate this type of strategy, you'll see a little uptick in claims utilization because we have people who are going to the doctor who haven't been and we will see an increase in some chronic disease management because people are being diagnosed as pre-diabetic, pre-hypertensive, and they're put on the meds to manage those diseases. That usually uh, levels off in years two and three, and we actually start seeing the benefit of some of that in years four and five. Year two, we will continue the requirement of the adult physical, but we're also gonna uh, require that people be tobacco free. Now, we haven't settled on the time frame around the tobacco-free part of year two, uh, but we will be working on that. We'll begin communicating that to the employees soon. And then as we look out further, years three through five, what possible requirements? Um, a lot of employers add age and gender appropriate screenings, and so those are your cancer screenings. Um, you know, we know that if we can di uh, catch di and diagnose cancer at stage one and two, it's going to be less costly with better outcomes. Year three, uh, we also look at participation in weight loss behavior programs. We're currently doing that some with United Healthcare. Um, a lot of employers have more formally adopted this strategy because there is a direct link between metabolic syndrome and healthcare claims. And then there are other programs that we can look at in the future as the data that we gather uh, tells us more about the risk of the group. So that's where we are today. Again, those RFPs are due Friday, and so we will begin our analysis, and um, we will be coming back to you soon. Thank you. I think we have a couple of questions. I have one. Okay. Is the tobacco free, is that something that more employers are doing? Yes, absolutely. In fact, you might remember Children's Hospital. You can't go to work at Children's Hospital if you use tobacco. Um, and, and a lot of 
employers have gone to tobacco-free campuses, and some are now testing for it and either charging a surcharge or just not employing people who are using tobacco. Okay. Thank you. Director Hendricks? No, that's on the next. It's, no, not for him. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Is that it? One more. On Director Adcock? On the tobacco free, is Little Rock City Hall or Little Rock City uh, buildings tobacco free? I, I believe they are. They are and have been for quite some time. Okay, thank you. There's designated smoking areas. And one of the things I would remind and, and let other board members know, we actually tried something uh, similar uh, 10 years ago uh, where an employee uh, had to sign an affidavit uh, saying that um, they were not using tobacco. And, and I, I, after <laughs> seeing somebody I knew personally that was using it and had signed that affidavit, I said, we need to kind of <laughs> rethink this. So this is another uh, effort in that, in that same vein. And plus, we still have our anti-smoking initiatives that we're pursuing. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now. Director Hendricks. Thank you. I want to pass along to each of you, and this is for discussion purposes only. It's an initial that deals with how the mayor could possibly be elected. Can pass it on. And the second one is a mem memorandum that deals with election to abolish at large positions, at large director positions. I know this is a bold something you all have never had before, but hang on. The ordinance also uh, deals with an election to uh, abolish the at-large positions. Talk to your mic, Tom. The ordinance also has a provision for an election to abolish the at-large positions. Yes. So. Tom, we're not going to discuss that today, is that right? Yeah, just take it home and digest it. Thank you, Director Hendricks. Thank you. S City Manager Moore? Oh, not on this item. Uh, I have just another item. On this item? Even... So Director Tom, Richardson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So, Tom, if I understood you correctly, the election, the the election of the mayor also deals with the abolition of the at-large directors. Director Richardson, um, two ordinances were prepared. One that made the election of a mayor a mere plurality, and one that did not. Okay. But both ordinances dealt with the. Uh, uh, elimination of the at-large spots. So is that is that even necessary? Is that not just duplication? I mean, they're both dealing with... The reason I did it is because uh, the mayor is an at-large position gotcha. and gotcha. there is... A, but the law somehow got muddled and so the mayor is a member of the board of directors for some purposes and directors are elected by plurality and that's that's why it was like that. Thank you, sir. Mr. Moore. Uh, another item that I need to add, and it will be ready, uh, I think, from the city attorney's office on Friday, or about Friday, is a resolution to extend our lease uh, with the Institute of Basic Life Principles that owns the old VA hospital. You know, we have the first floor there. Um, and I think you all heard a presentation uh, when I was out last week about the redevelopment plans. So we're going to extend the lease for another year while they work through that and then see where we go with a, maybe a long-term commitment. But I, I do need to add that because the lease expires at the end of this month. Thank you. Director Adcock? Uh, Mr. Carpenter, on page one of the ordinance, the mayor can call for a elec an election. Well, that's, that's how it's done. I mean, if you all pass the ordinance, the mayor calls for the election. Okay, but the board has to first pass the right, ordinance. you'd have to pass the ordinance. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. 
nobody else has their light on and I don't see any further business. Director Hendricks. I don't know whether you all read today's paper, but this is quite interesting about um, Little Rock sort of being on the bottom almost when it comes to ratings. It's an interesting article and I just hate that the mayor's not here, but uh, I'm sure he will read the paper. Did you all, did anybody read this? Arkansas ranks high in livability, but Little Rock falls. So we got a lot of work to do. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you. We will adjourn and we'll be back next Tuesday. Thank you.